Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for the Wednesday evening Bible study. And tonight we're getting back to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we're going to dive into our brand new study of the book of Deuteronomy. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Deuteronomy chapter 1. We try to have the text on the screen. You know that if you've been here for a while. But it's always good to have it open in our own laps or on a table where you can follow along. But as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns about the class, if you have something we need to be praying about as a church, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're studying a, uh, starting a brand new study of Deuteronomy. This comes within our larger study of the first five books of the Bible, and those first five books are sometimes known as the Pentateuch, and so I figure this may Maybe a good time to do a brief review since we're at the beginning of another book. The book, uh, the word Pentateuch simply refers to a five volume book. That's what the Pentateuch is. Uh, the Jewish people sometimes refer to this as the Torah. The teaching or the instruction is what that word means. So generally speaking, we know the first five books were written by Moses. We have a few references within these books themselves to Moses being the author. We have several references in the Hebrew Bible outside the first five books to Moses being the author of the Pentateuch. We also have some New Testament references to Moses being the author including several references from Jesus himself, where he notes that Moses is the author of these books. Uh, but I say, generally speaking, we agree that Moses is the author because there are a few exceptions within these five books. Uh, for example, we have the reference in Numbers uh, to Moses being the most humble man on the face of the earth, or something to that effect. Uh, which would be quite the boast if it actually came from Moses himself. So we think that's something that perhaps was uh, added later, or at least maybe God overrode that and put that in there. I don't know, but it's kind of, it's like when they give you a humility award, they take it away as soon as you hang it on your wall. Um, so maybe with uh, Moses uh, being the most humble man on the planet, Maybe that's not something that he said about himself. Uh, then we also have the reference to Moses' death, which is coming later in Deuteronomy. Hate to spoil that for you, but Moses is going to die in this book. And that would have been a little bit difficult for Moses to write about personally, seeing as how he would have been dead at the time. Uh, but just generally speaking, Moses writes a vast majority of what we find in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he probably puts pen to paper for most of it right around 406 or 1406 BC uh, toward the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. So maybe he did some writing along the way, but at least here at the end, like the book of Deuteronomy, for example, uh, would have been written down right there near the end of that 40 years. So right around 1406 BC. Uh, by way of review, since we have these books up here, the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. And in Genesis, we see the beginning of everything, the universe itself. Self, uh, plants, animals, people, then we have the first family with Adam and Eve, then they have children, we've got the first sin in there, the first sacrifice, the first prophecy, the first murder, that's just in the first few chapters. Uh, we have the great flood starting in Genesis 6, like 6 through 9. With Noah, we've got the beginning of all languages. Uh, a couple chapters after that, then we're introduced to Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, and his children, and Joseph being one of those children. And then Joseph saves his people and really the whole Middle Eastern world from this terrible famine. And that's how the descendants of Abraham end up in Egypt. They go down there to get food. Well, in Exodus, several hundred years have gone by, and a new Pharaoh comes in who does not really appreciate what Joseph Joseph had done in the distant past at this point, and so he enslaves the Hebrew people to keep them from either leaving or rebelling. Uh, however, they cry out to God, God hears their cry, God raises up Moses to deliver them from their slavery down in Egypt. And so we have the Passover introduced in Exodus chapter 12. We've got the actual exodus of the people out of Egypt, uh, of course, after the ten plagues. And then we have the giving of the Ten Commandments early on, as well as the rest of the law of Moses. So that's the book of Exodus. Well, over in Leviticus, we have what is basically a handbook for the priests, a manual on how to worship. And we have the reminder... 
with Nadab and Abihu that worship is dangerous. And that's a, a theme that is repeated throughout the Pentateuch. Worship is possible, which is absolutely awesome that we can even approach God in worship, but worship can be dangerous if the people were careless or if they were presumptuous about it. Well, then in Numbers, uh, the book that we just finished studying, the people head toward the promised land, but they send out spies to spy out the land. But 10 of the 12 spies bring back a bad report. You know, we can't do this. The locals are huge. We're small. It's a great land. I mean, in that regard, the report was positive. The negative part was we can't do it. And so they whine, they complain, God causes them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness until everybody 20 years old and older has died, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, those being the two spies that brought back the good report 40 years earlier. So in Numbers, it's called the Book of Numbers because it is a book of numbers. We have a census near the beginning of the 40 years, and then we have the 40 years, and then we have a second census right near the end of those 40 years, which again is why it's called the Book of Numbers. And the people are now camped out right across the Jordan River from the Promised Land. Well, this brings us to the book of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is basically, uh, it comes from a Greek word meaning repetition of the law. And there was like a translation issue there, a little bit of a mistranslation years back but pretty much a repetition of the law. So a second law, but it's not really the second law. It's a repetition of the first one or a re-giving, a retelling of it. And so that tells us what's in here. Uh, they first got the law on Mount Sinai, but that's been almost 40 years ago. And this is a new generation. So Moses will now repeat this law to the new generation as they prepare to cross over the Jordan River to take the land. Uh, the Jewish people would often title a book using the opening line. And so to the Jewish or the Hebrew people, those who speak Hebrew, they would refer to this book by the title, These Are the Words. These are the words. And so if you look at the book itself, it starts by saying, these are the words of Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert east of the Jordan and so on. So they would call this book, these are the words. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy then is a repetition of the words first spoken by God to the people through Moses at Mount Sinai. Uh, but Deuteronomy, I would point out, I, I believe is more personal than the book of Exodus, if we could say that. And it's more personal than Leviticus and Numbers. I mean, Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address. I think that's pretty much how we could summarize this. It's a series of speeches. In Deuteronomy, we see an emphasis on the love of God. And I almost think about the Apostle John writing, you know, very late in life. He was all about love, like everything had had a chance to sink in. And he'd matured a little bit, and you read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and it is just love, 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 love. And I, I get that impression with Moses now as an elderly man. He's coming back, he's repeating the law, but it's not just a legal brief. I, that, that's not the way this reads. It, it's He's begging the people to remain faithful. Please, please, please stay faithful to God. God loves you. You need to love him and so on. So these are some of the last words of encouragement from Moses to the nation before Moses dies. And he knows he's about to die because God has told him so. Uh, Moses is not allowed to cross over the Jordan. The people are right there at the point of crossing over themselves uh, under the leadership of Joshua. So Moses sees this coming. He sees he's about to leave this earth. And so he closes with this series of speeches, encouraging the people, begging them to remain faithful to God. By the way, can you think of probably the most famous use of Deuteronomy in the New Testament? Think about how Deuteronomy was quoted in the New. What's probably the most famous quotation from Deuteronomy? I don't know what you're thinking of, if some have come to mind, but I'm thinking of Jesus being tempted by Satan after going 40 days without food in the wilderness, and he quotes from Deuteronomy all three times. If you remember that, Satan wants this, this, and this, and Jesus replies, it is written, and then he quotes a passage from Deuteronomy all three times. So I just want to suggest that if Jesus knew Deuteronomy, and if Deuteronomy saved Jesus from falling to temptation right there in front of Satan, then we should probably pay attention to the book of Deuteronomy as well. I think that would be my encouragement. Um, it takes about 2 hours 45 minutes to read this book from cover to cover. If you're kind of an average speed reader, 
And so it's not the longest book in the Bible. It's up there, um, but it's very doable. And so I want to encourage you, if you have a chance to do that or to listen to it, you can click on almost any app for the Bible these days and it'll read it to you. So I would encourage us to do that as we get into our study. Uh, beyond this, Deuteronomy is quoted more than 40 times in the New Testament, exceeded in those quotations only by Isaiah and the book of Psalms. Those two books are quoted more than Deuteronomy, but uh, I mean, that's it's a pretty honorable mention here uh, to be quoted as often as it is. It is quoted, Deuteronomy is, is quoted in 20 out of the 27 books of the New Testament. So this was a significant book to the New Testament authors, and certainly it should be important to us as well. So let's just jump right into it tonight, right into the text. We'll take a look at the two opening paragraphs. I'm just kind of putting them together because they're so related. But Deuteronomy chapter 1, and let's look at the first eight verses. Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 8. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arabah opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, and Laban and Hezeroth and Dizahab. It is eleven days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the fortieth year... On the first day of the eleventh month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. After he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and Edrei. Across the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and set your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country and in the lowland and the Negev and by the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, <clears throat> as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to them and their descendants after them. So as the book opens, and just thinking back to what I just said about Deuteronomy and what it would be, notice what Moses is doing here in verse 1. Moses is giving a speech. Moses is speaking to the nation of Israel. And also, let's notice how the author says that Moses is speaking these words across the Jordan in the wilderness. So let's... Let's think about that for a little bit here. Moses is speaking to the nation across the Jordan in the wilderness. So does that give us some clue as to who actually wrote this? Uh, just a hint, it wasn't Moses. At least these opening words right here, this kind of prelude. Um, as I understand verse 1, somebody is saying, while we were still over there on the other side of the Jordan, this is what Moses said to us. And of course, we remember Moses never crossed over the Jordan, so somebody compiled this. Uh, Moses might have written the speech down. We might be looking at a copy of his notes for the speech, uh, but somebody other than Moses put this together, somebody who was on the other side of the Jordan. Maybe that was Joshua, maybe it was somebody else. But I also hope we notice something Moses emphasizes in verse 2. How long should it have taken? to get from Mount Sinai up to Kadesh Barnea, which is the uh, southern border of the Promised Land. It's an 11-day journey. How long did it actually take? 40 years. And I think Moses is very clearly setting this up as a failure of faith. What should have taken 11 days ended up taking 40 years because the people had failed to trust God's promises and because they whined and complained the whole time about it. And then notice at the end of verse 5, we've got another reference to this happening across the Jordan. And back on the other side, the east side of the Jordan, Moses undertook to expound this law saying, and then he continues. So uh, Moses will be renewing the covenant. And, and I think I would also point out, it's not going to be a word for word retelling, but he will expound on the covenant. He will explain it. He'll be reminding this new generation concerning what God had said to their parents and their grandparents. You know, I'm hoping someday uh, in the distant future, somebody will look back and they'll have a history of the Four Lakes congregation. They'll know something about the church in Madison, even though they weren't here at the time. 
And I think even about the like the Four Lakes congregation starting and then us meeting in the elementary school library and us finding a church building and us paying that off within less than a year. You know, those are stories of faith. And a lot of people at the congregation now were not here for those events. But I, I hope the next generation knows about those events. And I hope that makes sense to you. I think there's a value to passing along some history. And, and that seems to be what Moses is doing here. Not just a, a cold reciting of the law. These are the Ten Commandments and move on. But he's he's giving some context. He's explaining how he was there. And uh, this is what this, uh, this new younger generation needs to hear. All right. So we are now going back in time in a sense. Moses will be giving a review of the history of the nation over the next several chapters. And that's what we see starting in verse 6. So at Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai, um, God said, uh, you've been here long enough, so it's time to move out. Basically, I'm giving you the land. Now you people just need to stand up, walk in that direction, and walk into it. You just need to go. Uh, go and move. And, you know, I've promised this land to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now it's yours. So get up and move. The land is yours. That's kind of what Moses is communicating here. All right, let's continue with Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. The next kind of couple paragraphs go together again. Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 18. I spoke to you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear the burden of you alone. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousandfold more than you are, and bless you, just as he has promised you. How can I alone bear the load and burden of you and your strife? Choose wise and discerning and experienced men from your tribes, and I will appoint them as your heads. You answered me and said, The thing which you have said to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, and appointed them heads over you, leaders of thousands and of hundreds, of fifties and of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen, and judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen, or the alien who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not fear man, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me, and I will hear it. I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. Continuing with Moses' review of the past 40 years, he just refers back to the task being too big for one man to handle alone. And uh, he's saying, you people are a lot. <laughs> it's hard to deal with all that. And I would kind of note here, if we're honest with the text, which we have to be, I mean, leadership is described as a burden, isn't it? I don't think I've misunderstood that. I mean, he's saying it's hard. This is this is a heavy burden to bear. And I would also note that Moses describes the people as being numbered like the stars of heaven. And that's obviously a figure of speech. We don't know the number of the stars. If you remember, Abraham was once told that his descendants would be numbered like the stars of the, uh, like the number of stars or like the sand on the seashore. Though that's another figure of speech that God used. And, and I'm just saying that that part of the prophecy has now been fulfilled. Um, at the time Moses is writing this, even before he was writing this, he's referring back to the beginning of the 40 years. And so Moses, therefore, is told by God through the wisdom of his father-in-law Jethro, due to the, uh, the weight, the burden of leadership of that many people, you need to choose some wise men to help share that burden. And of course, that's what Moses does. He appoints wise men over small subgroups to render decisions, to solve problems, to deal with stuff, to put out fires. And this really was a turning point in the history of God's people. Leaders were appointed, and so that made Moses able to focus on the mission, which was getting them to the promised land where they now are. Um, and we carry this over today, I think, by noting that God intends the church to be uh, led, uh, shepherded by a plurality of men serving as elders or shepherds or overseers. Those are three terms used interchangeably in Scripture to describe the same position. You know, there's a danger to one man doing all the leading. That's that's not the way God intended it to be. There There is a benefit to multiple men leading together. So I think we could take that as a kind of a practical reminder here. Well, let's continue with Deuteronomy 1, verses 19 through 25. Deuteronomy 1, 19 through 25. 
Then we set out from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, just as the Lord our God had commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is about to give us. See, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you approached me and said, Let us send men before us, that they may search out the land for us, and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up, and the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and I took twelve of your men, one man for each tribe. They turned and went up into the hill country, and came to the valley of Eshcol, and spied it out. Then they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought us back a report and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God is about to give us. Well, continuing to look back at what happened 40 years earlier, Moses reminds these people that they were right there on the border of the promised land. However, practically on the eve of when they could have moved in, the people wanted to send some spies. And notice the reasoning here. We're told here they wanted the spies, first of all, to search out the land. You know that right there? Why? God already told them what was there. It's a land flowing with milk and honey and all that. So, I mean, even sending spies, in a sense, was a lack of faith. But then notice, secondly, they wanted the spies to tell them which way to go and which cities to enter. Do we see a little problem with that? How are the Israelites being led at that point? How are they getting from one place to another? Remember, they were following the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. So why then would they need spies to tell them where to go? So I think I would point out here, uh, yet again, they were not trusting God to lead them. And so they sent spies, kind of, we want to see this for ourselves. We want somebody else to tell us where to go and which cities to hit first. And, you know, so for the most part, the, the spies did bring back a good report concerning the land itself. Um, however, uh, Moses continues in Deuteronomy 1, 26 through 40. Deuteronomy 1, 26 through 40. Yet you were not willing to go up. But rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you grumbled in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are bigger and taller than we are. The cities are large and fortified to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, Do not be shocked, nor fear them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son in all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. But for all this you did not trust the Lord your God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way in which you should go. Then the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry, and took an oath, saying, Not one of these men, this evil generation, shall see the good land which I swore to give your fathers, except Caleb the son of Japuna. He shall see it, and to him and to his sons I will give the land on which he has set foot, because he has followed the Lord fully. The Lord was angry with me also on your account, saying, Not even you shall enter there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter there. Encourage him, for he will cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones who you said would become a prey, and your sons who this day have no knowledge of good or evil, shall enter there. And I will give it to them, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn around and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea." Well, just briefly summarizing here, the people get a good report concerning the land itself. We saw that in the previous paragraph, but they get scared. And now we see they whine, they moan, they groan, they complain. Moses has to intervene. He tries to encourage them to have courage. He does this by suggesting God will carry them uh, just as a man carries his son. I mean, that is really an awesome picture, I think, especially for us as fathers. Um, as dads, when we carry our children, do we intend to harm them? 
Um, of course not. Okay, we may throw them and, you know, ceiling fans get involved in all kinds of uh, fun stuff dads get to do. But no, we, we love our kids. And so God is, is carrying his people into the promised land, but they're still scared. And they were unwilling to go 40 years uh, previously. Um, ultimately, though, the people fail uh, to trust. God gets angry, angry enough to promise that only Joshua and Caleb are going to be allowed to enter the land. And uh, the little ones, uh, those that they said would be a prey in the promised land, those are the ones who are going to be the only ones to make it. And so kind of a, a twist there. God takes that, he turns it around, and you know, no, they are not going to die. In fact, you're going to die and they're going to make it. And so to accomplish this, the people were to turn around and they were to head back toward the Red Sea. They were to wander in the wilderness. By the way, just a brief note. I don't know if I just kind of noticed this again uh, looking at this tonight. Referring to um, the, the little people um, there, let's see, in the middle of verse 39, who this day have no knowledge of good or evil. That's an interesting way of, refer of referring to children. Uh, children are not accountable. They don't sin. They don't even know what sin is. And I, that's just interesting that he throws that in here. That's not his point, but that's how he describes the children. Uh, the little ones, I, I was looking up earlier today. I think the Hebrew word means something like those who trip or those with short legs. And uh, the tripping ones, I think that's just funny. You know, you've just finished wandering 40 years in the wilderness. You know, we got the trippers, oh, you know, the little kids with the short legs, you know, having a hard time keeping up. That's kind of how Moses uh, describes them here. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. It's kind of an interesting reference to uh, children. Anyway, we're, we're going to continue with Deuteronomy 1, 41 through 46. Deuteronomy 1, 41 through 46. Then you said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will indeed go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And every man of you girded on his weapons of war and regarded it as easy to go up into the hill country. And the Lord said to me, Say to them, Do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you. Otherwise you will be defeated before your enemy. So I spoke to you, but you would not listen. Instead you rebelled against the command of the Lord and acted presumptuously. And went up into the hill country, the Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and chased you as bees do, and crushed you from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord did not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. So you remained in Kadesh many days, the days that you spent there. All right, this is, again, this is review for most of us, and it is for these people who are hearing Moses speak now as well. Their fathers, maybe their grandfathers, once they heard they would no longer be heading into the promised land, they decided to go anyway, didn't they? Without God's help. We're just going to do it. We don't need you. We're, we're just, you know, you said we can do it. We're going to do it. And they fail. So they acted presumptuously. That is, they presumed to do something without a command from God to do it. Uh, God didn't tell them to do this at this moment. So they're, they're just going to do it on their own. And they fail. And notice how Moses describes this. They got chased like they were getting chased by bees. It's kind of graphic, isn't it? You think there were any bee chases in the 40 years in the wilderness? Absolutely. They had lots of drama in the wilderness that we don't know about. Um, I don't know if, if you've ever had to run away from some bees that were out to get you, like on a mission. Um, I remember I got stung while removing a chimney from a roof. At our first house down in Janesville, it had been a rental before us. It was in tough shape. We got a great deal on it, but it needed a lot of work. And I was up there checking on the roof. And I think that's when we were taking the chimney out. And I came down the ladder without using my legs. I got, I had rips in my knees and uh, some kind of bee or hornet got inside my jeans and were stinging me around my knees. And again, I got down the ladder without using my legs. My wife had never seen something so amazing as she did that night, uh, that day when I was coming down the ladder. Anyway, um, another time I got stung while mowing at church. Not cool uh, to get chased by bees, but I got out of there in a hurry. Well, so also the Israelites get chased out of the promised land when they try to take it on their own without God's help. So I think he's making the point, you cannot do that without me. They were trying to do it on their own power and they failed. In response, they pray to God. But notice in this passage, God refuses to listen to their prayers. I can think of at least two times in the New Testament where we read about God not listening to prayer. Um, do you remember the Pharisee and the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke? I think it's 18 where they both went into the temple to pray. 
you know, the Pharisee, I think the text says, prayed this to himself. He wasn't praying to God. He was praying to himself. Thank you that I'm not like that guy. I'm just paraphrasing. And then, of course, the the uh, the other guy, the Gentile, is over there, and, and he's praying, Dear God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That's the one God hears. God was not listening uh, to the uh, Pharisee. And then also there's another reference in 1 Peter 3. Peter says that God will not listen to the prayers of husbands who refuse to live with their wives in an understanding way. And that's a serious thing right there, for God not to listen to a person's prayers. Um, you know, a lot of times we may think, well, God has to listen to my prayer. No, he doesn't. And uh, he absolutely doesn't. There, there are some situations where he will not, and he's told us he will not. And this is what happened when the people tried to invade the promised land without his help. He refused to listen. By the way, why is God through Moses reminding them of this, all of this, right at this moment? Like, why now? Because they're once again at the border of the promised land. And Moses is desperately trying to avoid having these people make the same mistake that their parents and grandparents did. And that's why we're reading this tonight, because we also face circumstances today where we need to respond with faith. We need to react in faith. We need to actually do something in faith, uh, even in spite of being nervous or afraid. And um, so I think this is an encouragement for us. Okay, let's continue into the next chapter. So Deuteronomy 2, Deuteronomy 2, 1 through 15. Kind of, again, these two go together. Didn't want to separate them. And mess up the flow here. So Deuteronomy 2, 1 through 15. Then we turned and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me and circled Mount Seir for many days. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have circled this mountain long enough. Now turn north and command the people, saying, You will pass through the territory of your brothers, the sons of Esau, who live in Seir. And they will be afraid of you, so be very careful. Do not provoke them, for I will not give you any of their land, even as little as a footstep, because I have given them Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money, so that you may eat, and you shall also purchase water for them with money, so that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all that you have done. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord your God has been with you. You have not lacked a thing. So we passed beyond our brothers, the sons of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from the Arabah road, away from Elath, and from Ezion Geber. And we turned and passed through by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the sons of Lot as a possession. The Emim lived there formerly, a people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also regarded as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Emon. The Horites formerly lived in Seir, but the sons of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. Now arise and cross over the brook Zered yourselves. So we crossed over the brook Zered. Now the time that it took for us to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the brook Zered was 38 years until all the generation of the men of war perished from within the camp, as the Lord had sworn to them. Moreover, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from within the camp until they all perished. Well, we're not going to go through this line by line, but I think we get the impression here in this passage that they did a lot of circling, didn't they? Um, there's several references here to circling Mount Seir, and it seems they did that a number of times. Uh, then we have their interaction with the descendants of Esau. They are to pass through, purchasing their food and water. They are not to take any of that land because God gave that land to the descendants of Esau. So God has relationships with other nations, other people, other promises that he's fulfilling elsewhere. The same goes for the land of the Moabites in the second half of this passage. Pass through. Don't take their stuff. Uh, we've got a few references to some um, oversized people, I think we would say, in this passage. Giants, we might say. Uh, and this is interesting to me that God drove the giants out of the land, apparently for the descendants of Esau and some others. And apparently this is what God could have done for the Israelites if they had only had the faith to walk right in. And so it's almost as if they are now looking at what could have been, but with a 40-year delay that included 40 years of death in the wilderness. Like, I did for them what I said I would do for you, 
but you didn't believe me. And so they got their land, and here you are still wandering. That seems to be the message here. But nevertheless, this brings them pretty close to the present, kind of where we are for the book of Deuteronomy. 38 years have passed, according to verse 14. An entire generation of the men of war has perished at this point. And this is the Lord's doing. The hand of the Lord was against them, Moses says at the end here. These warriors did not die of old age. God was punishing the nation. He was punishing his own people. Well, let's continue with Deuteronomy 2, verses 16 through 25. Deuteronomy 2, 16 through 25. So it came about when all the men of war had finally perished from among the people, that the Lord spoke to me, saying, Today you shall cross over Ar, the border of Moab. When you come opposite the sons of Ammon, do not harass them nor provoke them, for I will not give you any of the land of the sons of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot as a possession. It is also regarded as the land of the Rephaim, for Rephaim formerly lived in it, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. A people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, just as he did for the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites from before them. They dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. And the Avim, who lived in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaphtarim, who came from Kaphtor, destroyed them and lived in their place, arise, set out, and pass through the valley of Arnon. Look! I have given Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land into your hand. Begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. Uh, this day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under the heavens, who when they hear the report of you will tremble and be in anguish because of you. So now that the men of war have died in the wilderness, it's time to press even closer to the promised land. And the people now head up to the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon. And we're not going to look at every verse here, but I do hope we notice verse 25. As a result of what is about to happen to Sihon, God will instill fear in the hearts of all the surrounding nations. And that's exactly what we see happen when we finally get to Jericho uh, in the book of Joshua. You may remember from our study of Rahab a couple months ago that Rahab and her people were absolutely terrified of the Israelites in part because of what God has done to Sihon. And I say has done, he hasn't done it yet in this account. We're kind of getting there in this, uh, in this summary. So let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph here, Deuteronomy 2, 26 through 37. Deuteronomy 2, 26 through 37. So I send messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, let me pass through your land. I will travel only on the highway. I will not turn aside to the right or to the left. You will sell me food for money so that I may eat and give me water for money uh, so that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot, just as the sons of Esau who live in Seir and the Moabites who live in Ar did for me until I cross over the Jordan into the land which the Lord our God is giving to us. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, was not willing for us to pass through his land. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate in order to deliver him into your hand as he is today. The Lord said to me, See, I have begun to deliver Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to occupy that you may possess his land. Then Sihon with all his people came out to meet us in battle at Jahaz. The Lord our God delivered him over to us and we defeated him with his sons and all his people. So we captured all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men, women, and children of every city. We left no survivor. We took only the animals as our booty and the spoil of the cities which we had captured. From a roar which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon and from the city which is in the valley even to Gilead, there was no city that was too high for us. The Lord our God delivered all over to us. Only you did not go near to the land of the sons of Ammon all along the river Jabbok and the cities of the hill country, and wherever the Lord our God had commanded us. Now, obviously, we just studied a lot of this in numbers, but they send terms of peace to Sihon. Sihon almost immediately attacks with his army. And I know there's a reference to God hardening his heart, kind of similar to Pharaoh. You know, a lot of times Pharaoh says he hardened his own heart, then half the time says God hardened his heart. I think those two things go together. Um, but in response to that hard heart, God has the Israelites just obliterate Sihon and his people completely. 
So this brings us to a place where I think we can be safe in pausing for a week. We're halfway through the first of several farewell speeches from Moses to the nation. And in this one, he's just recounting some of what they've been through together through the year. So he's kind of, you know, reestablishing this sense of uh, culture. This is who we are. This is what God has done for us. And I think we see the love of God here. Uh, that he really wants what's best for his people, but there are consequences to sinful behavior. And so next week, we want to continue with the second half of this speech, which is uh, Deuteronomy chapters 3 and 4. So as always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If there's anything that we can do for you, something we need to be praying about, if we can encourage you in some way, let us know. Uh, give me a call, send a text, 608-224-0274, or you can send me an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for being the God of Moses and the God who heard the cries of your people in the wilderness and delivered them uh, rather out of slavery in Egypt. We know that you are a God who makes and keeps some amazing promises. And you have turned your nation of uh, your people back then into a, a strong and mighty nation, just as you predicted they would be. And we're thankful, Father, that you are also mindful of what we're going through today and that you do hear our cries as well. As you've instructed, we continue praying tonight for our governing authorities. We pray for wisdom. We ask that during the transition from one president to another, that we as your people would continue to be able to live a quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and dignity. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for loving us. We love you. We're thankful for your leadership over us. We come to you tonight in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.